Hey guys, it's Allie. Welcome back to Infertile Up the podcast. This is episode 171 called Taylor. Hello, everybody. This is Allie and Blair, the co-founders of Fertility Rally. And we are here to tell you a little bit about who we are, what we do, and how we can support you on your infertility journey. So we wanted to let you know that Fertility Rally is the membership group that we created. It's the place we wish we had when we were in the thick of it. We offer support groups, we have private Facebook groups, we have tons of events, lots of videos, blog posts, so much content. We're starting to do IRL events as well, and we want to be there for you no matter where you are on your journey. Yeah, our favorite part, we had no idea where this would go when we started it, and our favorite part about it is watching all of our members, which is like 300 plus at this point, connect and create true lifelong friendships. We have members that are meeting up in real life. We have members that are supporting each other on Instagram. We have members that call each other best friends now. And honestly, like that is the most rewarding thing to see. We had no idea it would go here. And so we're just, we're inviting you to join the Rally Fam. Yeah, it's such a great space. It's a safe space. We also have fun when we can. So we would love for you to be a part of it. Check us out on fertilityrally.com and on Instagram at fertilityrally. Hope to see you guys soon. Today's episode is presented by Belly. Belly offers modern prenatal vitamins optimized for fertility, prenatal, and post-pregnancy health. To learn more about how to optimize your fertility and pregnancy health, check out their vegan-friendly, dairy-free, non-GMO vitamins for both men and women at bellybaby.com. That's spelled B-E-L-I-B-A-B-Y.com. The best part? If you use code Alley15, you'll get 15% off your first month of either Belly Women or Belly Men. Again, that's code Alley15, A L I 15, A-L-I-1-5, for 15% off. Thanks, Belly. Before we get started today, I just want to let you guys know that it is Fertility Rally's second birthday. We launched our community two years ago, June 1st, 2020, mid pandemic. And I can't believe how much it has grown and evolved and how many people we have been able to support and help and come to love and just become this giant family. We've had more than 1,900 members pass through our doors in the last two years. We have had more than 300 support groups. We have had more than 80 rally babies born. We have had four rally live events and so much more. And to celebrate our second birthday and our continued growth, we are offering a really special deal. This is the lowest price of the entire year. It's $129 for an annual membership, which is insane. It's $70 off and you get so, so much with that. You can go to our Instagram over at Fertility Rally and check out everything that that entails or go to our website, fertilityrally.com. But we just would love to support you guys if you're going through this or if you have a loved one who is. We can't thank all of our current and past members enough for trusting us and letting us support and love you guys. We are not stopping anytime soon. This is just the beginning. So thank you to everybody and check us out at Fertility Rally. Okay. So today's episode is you guys are going to love this one. Today I'm talking to my very dear friend, Taylor, who you might know from Instagram at infertile and impatient and who I met when she joined fertility rally. And Taylor has been through a ton today. She's going to tell us everything that happened leading up to the birth of her twin girls, Quinn and Charlie, who are so scrumptious that it was obviously not an easy road to get there. So we're going to talk about how Taylor was blindsided by miscarriage after miscarriage how she was told by doctors that she had bad luck, which we all fucking hate that, don't we? Her diagnosis of a balanced translocation, the discovery of chronic endometritis, which is an infection, not to be confused with endometriosis, and then how Taylor set a goal for herself to make 10 embryos and how, in her words, making those embryos became kind of an obsession. So she is honest, she is raw, she's talking about all the ups and downs, and you guys are really going to love this episode. So I love her, and I thank her, and without further ado, this is Taylor's Infertility Story. Ah, 
Taylor. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to talk to you. I feel like we had like the Chicago instant connection and I've always just been drawn to you and your story. Um, met you through Fertility Rally and Instagram and all that stuff. So hi, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm I'm excited to talk to you. It's been a while. I know. I've been following <laughs> along and we'll give everybody a spoiler alert, but they probably know this because I'm sure everybody follows you anyway. But you do have twin girls and we're going to talk about how the long journey you guys took to get to them and all that. So let's start at the beginning. How did you and your husband, Sean, meet and get together? We met at work. Um, it was a little bit of a scandal at first. Um, Ooh, I love a scandal. Like a yeah. <laughs> don't tell anybody we're dating kind of scandal. Yes, exactly. We were um, personal trainers. Neither of us are anymore by the time we were. And yeah, it was kind of happened a little bit unexpectedly. And then it was a secret for a while until we kind of got caught. <laughs> and then it was no longer a secret. Was it um, like one person was the other person's boss type of thing and you weren't supposed to be dating or just like... Exactly. Yep. Sean okay. was my manager. Um, I was the first person that he hired when he moved to Chicago for this job. So <laughs> it okay. was a little ironic. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And then how did you get caught? Good question. That is still a big mystery. Ooh, unclear. All right. If anyone's listening and busted them, let me know. We'll (laughs) We'll we'll do a follow-up. So did you guys know right away that you were going to end up together? I think we kind of had to decide early on, you know, it was either, we weren't going to just have a casual relationship if ultimately you know, Sean's job was on the line. So I do think it kind of made our relationship progress a little bit faster for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So cutting to when you guys did end up getting married, when did you start talking about building a family? I kind of have a different beginning of my story than a lot of people because I never wanted kids. Okay. Wasn't a kid person. I'm still not really a kid person. Mm -hmm you know, I have three dogs and I wanted to do other things with my life. And Sean was kind of, he didn't really seem to feel super strongly one way or the other. So it was never really a conversation. Mm -hmm. I just thought we wouldn't. And then one day it just kind of, I think changed for both of us. So that was in 2018. We both just kind of clicked and we're like, okay, we want kids. (laughs) What do you think changed? I don't know. It's not even like I had a lot of friends who had babies at that time. So it's not like I was around them. I don't know. I think we just kind of got a feeling that we were, that we were ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then what happened? Did you guys start to try? We did. We started to try. And I always had this fear of even before I, you know, thought I wanted kids. I thought it would be hard for me. Um, Mm. I just had this feeling I could just picture myself three years down the road, still trying, still no baby. Um, I had some people in my life that had recently gone through infertility. So I think that kind of, you know, made me, um, a little bit more aware of it. Mm -hmm. And I got pregnant right away. I think Mm. like months after. And so I was like, Oh, what, you know, what was I so worried about? (laughs) Like, right. This was, um, you know, no big deal. And then that obviously, you know, was not the end of the story because it ended up in a miscarriage. And Mm -hmm. um, I really was kind of blindsided by that. I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. Um, Almost to the point where when I first found out I was pregnant, I was like, oh, shit, no, not yet. Like I Mm. thought it was so much longer than it did, which is kind of annoying to like look back now, like, really, Taylor? (laughs) No, but I think that's human. And I'm glad that you share that. You know, it's like, how are you supposed to know? And that's okay to feel that way at the time. You know, it's not like everybody's always ready for this. Yes, Um, exactly. So tell me about that miscarriage. And I'm so sorry that happened to you. Did you, what was it like you started bleeding or like, how did you find, figure it out? So I went in, you know, really early for some blood draws and things were just kind of, they were like, okay, basically the results were like, it's okay. It's not great. Come back, keep checking. Oh, there's a little bit of growth, a little bit of, you know, your pregnancy HCG levels raised a little bit, but not a lot. And it was just this like living in limbo for weeks. Mm. And I think it went on. I mean, I first went in for my blood draw when I was four weeks and we finally got, you know, answers like when I was 10 weeks along. Okay. So it was really drawn out. Um, that's hard. I ended up having a DNC when I was about 10 weeks and the doctor told me, you know, she said you could do genetic testing after the DNC, but it's expensive and I don't think you need it. Mm -hmm. And so I was just kind of like, 
so overwhelmed. I thought, okay, well, you're the doctor. <laughs> you're like, what do I know? Sure. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't ask for other testing. And I remember her very clearly saying to me, medically speaking, you probably just have bad luck. Mm. And I was like, okay, I'm kind of a control freak. So that doesn't really sit well with me. Right. But, you know, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And she was very compassionate. She was very kind, but she said, as soon as you're ready, you know, you have my, you know, my blessing to try again. And so we did a couple months later and I was pregnant pretty fast after that. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in New York for a work trip and I was at dinner and all of a sudden I just had this feeling. I I always knew when I was pregnant mm. and I had this feeling, I was like, oh my gosh. And so I left, went and got pregnancy tests and they were positive. Of course, I probably did like 50 of them. Mm-hmm. Wait, how did, what was the feeling? <laughs> was it just like a gut feeling or how did you know? Um, it was a, I don't know. I just have always known all, every time I've been pregnant, I've always just known right away. Wow. That's I think I have cool. like a, a sense. Yeah. Um, you're like super in tune with your body. Yeah. Yeah. And so then I, it was a little bit hard to get excited because I felt like, okay, this doesn't end well for me, but I still was a little bit more hopeful. So, you know, I told John the next day and I was there for a week. And by the time that I had gotten home from the trip, I had started bleeding. So Mm -hmm. at that point I told my doctor, I don't even want to come in. I don't want to do this again. Mm -hmm. So you know, that technically I found out later I'm doing quotes, doesn't count as a pregnancy because it wasn't, um, they never had record of it in the clinic. Okay. And that I feel like that's bullshit. <laughs> completely. I could go yeah. on for days and days about yeah. like, why kind of like the hoops that you have to jump through to get answers, um, right. which I, like hindsight, looking back, like if I knew then what I knew now, right. I but also the minimizing that. of, you know, the loss you know, and people trying to brush that under the rug, like you weren't very far along or it was never recorded in the clinic or it was chemical or it was a missed miscarriage, like all that stuff. I, I just feel like it's a lot, you know, we've said this a million times, a loss is a loss and it needs to be recognized as such because we need to grieve that loss and we need to be validated that we went through that. Exactly. I just felt like, well, it counts to me, you know, it was, yeah. it was still something that we went through. So that was, that was rough. But, you know, they just said, like, sometimes it happens. And, you know, my sister had had two losses before she went on to have three healthy kids right in a row. So I thought, okay, like, you know, I guess it's just, I guess maybe it is bad luck. Mm. And then the third time I was pregnant. um, So this was all within a year. I was pregnant, I would say, like three months later. Mm -hmm. How old were you at the time, too? I was 29. Okay. So still very young. Yeah. And yeah. that's what they kept saying. You know, you're young, you don't have any other um, medical conditions. Like mm-hmm. this is probably just bad luck. And so after my third loss, which I ended up not needing a DNC for, I said to them, do you believe me now that there's something going on? I mean, mm-hmm. like, can I, and now can I start doing some testing? And they said, okay, yeah, you know, you can go, we, you can go see a fertility doctor and mm-hmm. I, then I ended up doing some diagnostic testing and it's crazy because my main diagnosis was a very simple blood draw. It's something that took like 48 hours for me to figure out. Mm-hmm. And they would have just after my first miscarriage, if they would have not cornered me into saying, no, I don't want additional testing. They probably would have found that out and it would have saved, you know, probably two more miscarriages after that. And so much heartache. So yeah. the fact that you advocated for yourself and asked for this testing, you know, this is so good for people listening now to know that you can ask and you can advocate. And sometimes, you know, doctors are wonderful and they're amazing, but they're also human. And sometimes they miss stuff or sometimes, you know, they're not thinking what you might be thinking. So it's okay to go out and ask for stuff. Exactly. And I didn't know that I thought I needed permission from my OB to mm-hmm. see a doctor. I, yeah. I thought, like they had to write, it wasn't like that. It was like, okay, just make an appointment. Like That's all I had to do was just make an appointment. Right. It's such a good lesson. So what did you yeah. find out? What was the diagnosis? So the whole time my husband and I both, we kind of thought it was something with him, <laughs> to be honest, mm-hmm. because, you know, he has some other health issues. He has type one diabetes and just, mm-hmm. you know, we, we just weren't, not that that causes it, but we just kind of had a feeling that maybe it was him. He, he felt the same way. 
And then we got, you know, we both did testing and his results. Great, 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 great. And then mine came back and I had, um, the first thing that they found out was I have a balanced translocation, mm-hmm. which is a genetic uh, condition where, um, you're, there's no other like side effects except for pregnancy loss. So what mm-hmm. happens is on your chromosomes, two pieces of genetic material switch places. So it's not an uneven swap. So there's no, you know, underlying conditions with me. It doesn't cause anything else. It's just when cells are dividing during reproduction, basically that uneven swap can cause a lot of different issues. Mm -hmm. One of them being early miscarriages. Another one being, you know, live births with several types of birth defects. Other ones can be late term, you know, um, losses. Mm -hmm. Every translocation is unique, which is hard because, there's not a lot that's known about translocations in general, particularly about individual translocations. Okay. So did you have anybody in your family? Is it hereditary or did you know anything about this? Had you ever heard of it before? I had not. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone in my family has it. No one's ever been tested for it. You Mm -hmm. know, my grandma had some miscarriages. My sister did, but my mom had three kids. My sister had three kids. My grandma had a lot of kids, you know, so I don't know. It's hard to say. It can happen spontaneously or it can happen. It can be genetic. So what was your thought when you got that diagnosis? And did they tell you what you would have to do in terms of treatment or like next steps? I got the results sent to my portal and it was all very confusing, but I saw balanced translocation and a bunch of, it looks like a bunch of letters and numbers and X's and Y's. Mm-hmm. I just Googled it. And I like was hieroglyphics. Like, yeah. <laughs> what is this? Yeah. I was like, this does not sound good. Mm-hmm. And I, like I said, kind of a control freak. Like I really have to know what's going on. And so I just like got into this huge rabbit down the rabbit hole before my doctor even talked to me and I knew that it wasn't good. And then I also had low AMH. So basically not enough eggs for my age. It was like 0.7 and I was 29. So it was pretty low. And then I had chronic endometritis, not endometriosis, but endometritis, which is an infection. Mm -hmm. And that could have been for my DNC. It's impossible to really know, but it can result in, you know, um, implantation failure or miscarriage. Okay. So it was a lot. I was really overwhelmed. I w- I kind of was blindsided, like all of these problems that I had that I didn't know. And I felt a lot of the guilt, to mm. be honest, because Sean's results were great, 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 great. Everything's great. And I was just taken back. Like, this is all my fault. This is yes. my burden to carry now. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit more in the guilt that, you know, we as women put on ourselves, like, what were you, how did that manifest for you? Like, did it cause you to feel like any sort of like depression or like relationship issues or like, what did it look like in your case? Yeah, it was hard. I think it was hard for Sean and I for a while because Sean has never to this day said, this is on you or this is your diagnosis or anything like that. But it is my body that was carrying these pregnancies. Mm -hmm. And so one of the doctors had said stuff to us about, you know, of course, cutting back on your caffeine, just general like fertility type stuff. And I remember we would get into these huge fights about caffeine because I'd pour coffee and he'd be like, Taylor, you know, they said you can't drink coffee. Mm. Like they didn't say I couldn't drink coffee. They just said to cut back. And he's like, do you think that's a good idea? And, you know, we were so freaked out and we had to have this conversation, right? Like, look, I have way more going on with my body. I did not have these miscarriages because I'm drinking caffeine Mm -hmm. and it could be a process that lasts for years and years and years. And I can't give up everything. So we need to find a balance. We need to find a middle ground for this. And luckily we did, and it was a lot better. And I was drinking coffee freely throughout IVF and pregnancy and everything. (laughs) Yeah. But that's hard. And I think, you know, it's like I said, a lot of times we put that on ourselves and sometimes you know, you feel broken or like your body is not working. And that's a hard thing to bear when you're like, I'm not able to give my husband, you know, make him a dad or, you know, your partner, make them a parent. Or like I've had somebody say recently to me, like, I felt so guilty that I wasn't able to make my parents, grandparents, you know, that all of that, that we put on ourselves. It's, it's really another like burden of this whole thing. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's a very heavy burden to, to carry. And it took a long time 
to kind of, you know, a I guess, get used to that. And I think I still, there's some things I still struggle with that because of, you know, complications I had on later in pregnancy as well, that, you know, made things difficult where I'm like, was it my fault? And what did I do? And kind of having to remind myself, you know, like the doctor said, it's just bad luck Mm -hmm. um, for context, but like, you know, there's nothing that I did wrong, but it's hard to, to remember. Okay. So what were you guys looking at in terms of next steps? We kind of right away decided that we would do IVF. I was very lucky that I have good fertility coverage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we still had to pay a lot out of pocket, but we were able to do, you know, a couple cycles back to back, thankfully because of the coverage that my work has. That's great. Yes. It was, I mean, I I've sent so many emails to my HR being like, thank you so much. Like I have kids because of you now, mm-hmm. because, you know, we wouldn't, I don't know how far we would have been willing to go. Um, just given, you know, kind of the, all the, the factors that we had working against us, you know, the not enough eggs and the infection and the procedures that I needed and the extra testing and the, you know, translocation where I have a very high percentage of, um, chromosomally abnormal eggs. And it was just a lot. So mm-hmm. I'm thankful for that. So we kind of right away, jumped into IVF, uh, did mm-hmm. consult did all of the testing and, you know, prep work for that. And then as we all know, March, 2020 COVID. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So that caused some delays, unfortunately. Did I'm, you have to cancel cycles or? I did. Yes. That's actually where my Instagram handle came from infertile and impatient because mm-hmm. I was waiting for IVF to start. And I was emailing them every day, any updates, what's going on? Like, you know, I I was so frustrated and I I understood why, I mean, my first clinic, it was at a hospital, so they had to use their resources for other things, Yeah, but I I couldn't wait anymore. So I ended up switching before I even did my first round and it was a really good switch. I switched to Vios. I love them. I know you do. (laughs) I know we work with them so much. They just yeah, sponsored Fertility Rally Live. Oh, uh, yeah. They're the best. Yeah, yeah, they really are. Decision. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I started my first round in, I think, July of 2020, June or July. From March to June, I mean, it's really not that much time, but it felt like years. Okay. So you switched over to them. And then what was, what did they tell you? Like, were you able to start sooner with them? I was. Yeah. Okay. I was able to start pretty much right away. They got me in quickly and I could start my first round. Okay. So what was, and with your translocate, your balance translocation, were they saying like, you definitely had to have everything tested, right? Like all the, any embryos you made and all that. Yeah. So I have to do a specific type of genetic testing. It's called PGT SR. Mm -hmm. And the SR part means is it looks at all the other chromosomal, you know, the kind of normal um, abnormalities that any person could have with their eggs or embryos but it also looks for the structure of the eggs to make sure that, or the embryos to make sure that the chromosome pieces are in the correct spot, basically. Okay. So yeah. tell me about that first round. How did you do with the meds and all that stuff? Um, it was, it was hard. So the first day, like I said, my husband is a type one diabetic, so he's been doing shots for years. So he was very good to have because I definitely had, you know, a meltdown the first day. I couldn't figure out the menopause, the menopure. It was a little chaotic. I had, you know, a COVID scare. I didn't have COVID, but I thought I did. And Mm. I had a hard time with the medications the first round, Mm -hmm. but my expectations going into it were so low. I you know, I'm a science person. I love science. And so I understood that it was kind of a science experiment, which again, was a little bit easier for me to, I think, accept that because we did have good insurance benefits, which is not fair, but it's just, you know, how it was. So my first round, we got eight eggs Mm -hmm. and we ended up with two embryos. I didn't know if that was good. I didn't know if it was bad. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I was totally no expectations. Okay. We didn't genetic, we didn't do genetic testing on our embryos at first because I knew that with the translocation, you know, every person has is going to have some abnormal embryos that they make, especially, you know, the older you get. I was 29 at the time. So I'm, you know, not like a, I guess not terribly old or young. So kind of right in the middle. Mm-hmm. And I knew that the percentage of 
the embryos affected by my translocation could be really high. I mean, some people it's like hundred percent end up affected uh, that they're not usable to be transferred. So I wanted to bank the embryos. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have them tested it right away. We just had them biopsied and frozen and then kind of went right into the next round. Okay. So did you have in your mind how many rounds you wanted to do kind of back to back before you did like, were you going to do like batch testing with the embryos? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I wanted to have 10 embryos. Okay. That's kind of my goal. So the first round I had two. The second round, I went into it with way more expectations. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, you know, that was the science experiment. Now it's time to get results. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to tweak my medications. I'm going to get so many more eggs. I'm going to get so many more embryos. This is going to be way better. I was responding better. Everything was off to a much better start. We ended up getting, I think, 14 eggs. So quite a bit more than what I got the first time. Mm -hmm. And then it came time for the first day report where the eggs mature. And I had less than half that were mature. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the, what, what is going on? Mm -hmm. I was just so taken back. And then by the time we got to the embryo report, there was only one. And I was, it, it, that was probably the hardest part for me because mm -hmm. I thought there's no way this is normal. You know, just given the stats of, of a balanced translocation, there's no way this one embryo is normal. Mm -hmm. And I was, it was really difficult. I took a couple of days. I watched a lot of, you know, crappy TV. <laughs> I ate a lot of Kraft mac and cheese. I was, yes. very, I was crying. I was really, it was difficult. Yeah. It's devastating, especially when your expectations are at a certain place, you know, yes. and then you get these reports. So what were the, what was your doctor saying? She was, you know, kind of just, I mean, she was very empathetic, understood how I felt, but was like, we just need to make more tweaks. You know, sometimes this just happens. And I was, I kept saying like, I had double the eggs retrieved. How did I have half the embryos? Like the math for me, it just didn't add up. Right. And that's something that has just been the hardest. One of the hardest parts for me about all of this is the output does not always equal results. And yeah. it so frustrating. Oh yeah. I remember feeling so frustrated with that too. And, and saying like, this is like studying the hardest you can for a test and still getting an F like I'm doing yes. all the things I'm doing everything exactly. right. It makes no sense. And that was really hard for me to wrap my head around. And I think, you know, you being who you are and so smart and so driven, you know, it's like, we've always learned if you work really hard at something, it will work out. And this yeah. with infertility, that is not the case. And that's fucking <laughs> such a mind fuck. <laughs> it, seriously is. it is. It really is. It's like the waiting and the, what we were just saying, like the results not equaling your, your output is just, it's awful. It was mm -hmm. so much worse than the medications. It was worse than the retrievals. It was worse than anything. It's mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what did you do after you ate all the mac and cheese and watched all the shows? Were you like, all right, we're doing it again? Yes. And um, what did Sean think? Like, how was he feeling? I think he was just a little, you know, like freaked out probably to see me like that because I was very much like, okay, we got to go do this. This is what we're doing. I'm going to ask about this, like very organized with the whole process, like very determined. And at that point I was like, I don't want to do this. I, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. My eggs were, it's not going to work with my eggs. Let's think of other options. And he was not really ready to, to have those conversations yet. So we took a little bit of a break. I think well, it was not terribly long, um, but we, I turned 30, we went away for a couple of days and then I, you know, jumped into another cycle. Mm -hmm. We really didn't have a lot of time to, I guess, process how right. we were. Thinking. Okay. Yeah. So how did that next cycle go? It went well. I had, I got three embryos that time mm -hmm. and I was so happy because I remember saying, if we get two, I'll be happy. And we got three. And I was mm -hmm. like, it, it just felt like a miracle to me. And had they changed your protocol at all? They did. They, okay. they, I stimmed for longer and they did a, like a lower dose of medication. Okay. okay. Yeah. So then you had, was it six total embryos? I had, yes, yeah, six at this point. Okay. So were you like, let's keep going, still shooting for that 10? Yes. I thought we'll do two more rounds or a couple more rounds. Um, and I also found out that the, the lab that I use for genetic testing, basically you could pay like the same amount to test eight as you could for one. So I'm like, why would we pay, you know, 4,000 or $5,000 each round? Let's mm -hmm. just have it all at once. So financially it, it made a lot more sense too. Okay. So the fourth round was our best round. Mm -hmm. We ended up getting four embryos. 
I, oh, I just got goosebumps thinking about it because Aww. it was like, they called me and I was like, there's, I, I just couldn't believe it. I was in shock Yeah, because that was our 10. That's what we wanted. And it was just, it was such a great day. I've actually not too long ago, looked back at some pictures I took of around that time. And I was like, I was just so happy. Yeah. And it's weird because it's like going through IVF, I forgot that the end goal was to have a baby. Okay. I felt like my goal was to make embryos. Right. Yeah. That's such a good point. And the perspective you know, sometimes you have these blinders on and these goals in mind and it's like, wait, why are we even doing this? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And I think it's important too, for people, for, you know, whoever's going through it with their partner, or if they're going through it alone, if they're get on this kind of almost like a treadmill or like you have the blinders on to kind of every once in a while, check in and be like, okay, what do we want here? What's, what do I want? Do I still want this? Where, you know, where am I willing to go with this? When am I willing to stop? Cause it's hard to, yeah get off that conveyor belt sometimes. It is. It it kind of became an obsession almost. Yeah. It was like this competition, I guess, that I had with myself of like, how much more can I do? How many embryos can I get this time? And it very much felt like a, a measure of my worth or something. Like yeah. it was, it was a weird feeling. And then we got to a point where we had embryos and it was time to test and potentially transfer. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not doing this. I'm, I do retrievals. I don't do transfers. <laughs> That's so good. I'm so glad you pointed that out. It's so true. Yeah. So what, okay. So you have the 10, you mm-hmm. sent them for testing and what happened? Well, we had a plan. We said if, cause we knew we wanted two kids and we knew that it doesn't, you know, sometimes it takes m- multiple transfers to get one. And with my AMH being so low, I wanted to have all of the embryos that we needed up front to have two kids. Mm -hmm. So we had a plan. We talked to Dr. Jelani. We said, okay, if we have four normal embryos, we'll transfer. If we have three, we'll do another retrieval and try to get another embryo. Okay. Well, Sean made a very good point. He said, if we have three, we do a transfer. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, we'll go to another retrieval. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that makes a lot more sense. So we started our transfer prep. You know, I told Dr. Galani, this is why I love her because she's very open to, you know, my opinions. I said, I want to do everything. You know, we've done the saline sonograms. We've done the HSGs. We've done the biopsies, you know, but I want to do, I want to, I want to take this approach. Like I've had failed transfers before Mm -hmm. was kind of what I want do. Mm -hmm. And she was totally okay with that. So we did a hysteroscopy, which Mm -hmm. I'm glad we did because they found a polyp that was not seen on my other tests. Mm -hmm. And she said it probably could have prevented implantation. Okay. So then you have that removed. Mm -hmm. Yep. We had that. I did an ERA and I found out that I needed an extra 24 hours of progesterone. Okay. And I did kind of a kitchen sink protocol. So I don't have any known clotting or immune issues, but we did Pepsid, Claritin, prednisone, Lovenox, all the whole, you know, the whole gang of, <laughs> you know, immunology and clotting mm-hmm. protocol. Okay. I want to do everything. Yeah. And she was more than happy to do that. So uh-huh. that's what we did. Yeah. That, that is one thing I love about Ruhi Jelani, who you're talking about, who's your doctor mm-hmm. is that, you know, she's a fertility patient herself and she's yeah. been through a lot of this stuff. And, you know, she just did our keynote at Fertility Rally Live and was talking about all these kind of, you know, experimental, for lack of a better word, when she was like, I wanted to do them all myself as well. So she's much more open to doing that for her patients, which I think is good. And I think a lot of people are progressive in that way and moving in that direction. So that's awesome. Today's episode is sponsored by Chatbooks. If you're like me, you have approximately 10 squillion photos on your phone and you're not sure what to do with them all. But recently I discovered Chatbooks, which makes it beyond easy to print your photos straight from your phone into custom photo books. And the cool thing is that with Father's Day coming up, you can create a personalized Father's Day gift for your dad or a loved one in your life in less than 10 minutes. I don't think my father-in-law is listening to this podcast right now, but don't tell him that he's getting his own custom chat book for Father's Day, and I made it directly for my phone in just a matter of minutes. Chatbooks photo books offer soft cover or hardcover options, a range of sizes from 6x6 to 10x10, 
and several chic spine and cover colors and designs. So here's what you need to do. Download the Chatbooks app to get started today and use the code DAD20 to get 20% off your Father's Day photo book. That's it. Easy peasy. And a gift that whoever receives it will not soon forget. Again, go to Chatbooks app, use the code DAD20, and you'll get 20% off any photo book. Thanks, Chatbooks. Yeah, I hate, I hate, I would hate to hear, well, oops, (laughs) I would hate to hear let's have, let's see if this transfer fails first and then do something else. Right. That's not what I wanted to do. So he was very open to that. Right. So I think it's another thing for people listening to know you can ask about all this stuff. And if you don't have a doctor who listens to you, I'm not saying it's time to switch clinics immediately, but like there are doctors out there who will listen to you. So just keep that in mind. If you're not happy with, you know, the, the way you're being validated or the way you're being listened to. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it should be a partnership. And obviously the doctors know a million times more than what we do, mm-hmm. but they should at least listen. And if something doesn't make sense, explain why, okay. You know, have more of a conversation than just totally shutting you down because that does happen a lot. And it's really unfortunate because it's, it's such a personal thing that we're, we're going through. Right. Okay. So what happened next? I'm like on the edge of my seat. I know what's, (laughs) I kind of know where we're going, but I love hearing all these details. Yes. We did a transfer. Uh, we transferred one embryo. We let them pick. I did not know the sex. I did not care. We didn't really have any opinions on it one way or the other. And I had that gut feeling again, that it worked. And I told everyone I wasn't going to be testing because I didn't want people to ask me if I was testing because Mm -hmm. I knew I was going to be. Mm -hmm. And I did, I started really early. I think like day five Mm -hmm. and I got negative day five, maybe even day four. I don't know. It was pretty early negative day four, day five, day six, I think day seven even. And Sean was starting to freak out. And I'm like, it, I just, I knew I was like, I'm telling you it's fine. It's going to be pregnant. I'm going to be pregnant. I know it. I know it. And I think part of that was um, just being naive. Mm. It became first transfer, but I did have that kind of gut feeling again. Mm-hmm. I started getting positives. I would wake up every day at like 4am and test. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then again at seven. And then, you know, I was a, a big tester right? And then again for my beta and it was positive. Okay. So yeah. how did that feel? It felt good. I, you know, it felt really good. Obviously I, I was nervous I think like I was saying before, I felt like I don't do, I I forgot about the end goal. I forgot. I kind of took my eyes off the prize. And so I was nervous, you know, Mm -hmm. even though like it had been years that we had been trying, I still felt like, oh my God, am I ready for this? I had no idea what was to come. Um, But yeah, it was a, it was an exciting time. The waiting between ultrasounds and betas was awful, Mm -hmm. but we got through it. And I had my first ultrasound around, I think, six weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what happened there? (laughs) The surprise of a lifetime. I was in the ultrasound room by myself because of COVID. And the ultrasound person said, there's two. And I was like, to what? (laughs) What do you you mean? She said, right. You're like, we transferred one. So what are you talking about? Yeah. She said, there's two babies. And I said, no. No, there's not like, and she, I mean, I was, I knew it was possible. I never in a million years thought that that was what was going to happen to us. I mean, mm-hmm. I was so, I guess, confident in my, you know, two week wait, not that confident. I didn't know it worked double. Mm-hmm. So I called Sean, I FaceTimed him from the ultrasound room and I told him there's two babies and he just as serious as could be told the ultrasound person, that's not possible. We only transferred one. I think that you're wrong. Right. (laughs) We were totally shocked. Yes. But there were, right? So what happened? Explain that from a, from a scientific point of view, what happened? Yeah. Yeah. So what happened is they transferred one embryo and when an embryo is transferred and implant, well, not just transferred, but when embryo implants is fertilized and, you know, egg is fertilized and implants, the cells divide. And during that process, basically our embryo split in half. Mm -hmm. So it's the same embryo, but it turned into identical twins. Oh my God, Taylor. Um, (laughs) Yeah, huge surprise. And it was 
it was hard at first, to be honest, Mm -hmm. when we got that news, I had a lot of feelings of, I was so overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I thought there's, there's no way I can handle this. This Mm -hmm. is, you know, and I'm always, I'm such a warrior and I'm always worrying like three steps ahead. I was thinking they're going to be premature. We're going to have problems. This isn't going to, you know, I, I just was spiraling from Mm -hmm. like, I was like four weeks pregnant or six weeks pregnant. And I, I was freaking out. And then I had so much guilt. I thought, you know, I know how hard it was for us to get here. I know how many people would kill to be in this position. And here I am, you know, just ungrateful. And, you know, it, it it was hard. I I had a lot of therapy to, you know, to learn that I could be grateful and also terrified. Yes. I I was going to say, I don't think it's ungrateful. I think it's just fucking freaking out. (laughs) And that's human. Yeah, I was. And, you know, we had, there was some like issues from day one. I mean, baby a, who is now Quinn on, you know, our first ultrasound didn't have a heartbeat. She was Mm -hmm. a lot smaller, you know, she was a lot smaller the whole time. And I just remember thinking like, we're having problems with one and that's going to affect both of them. And then I felt guilty. Like, Oh my God, do I love one more than the other? Like it was, it was a mind fuck for sure. <laughs> sure. That's all very, very valid and relatable yeah. for people yeah. that have been through this. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a pretty, the first trimester was rough. Um, then I started getting sick and, you know, it wasn't too bad, but really the anxiety part was the, was the, was the hardest part for me. Mm-hmm. I had really bad, um, I guess, antepartum anxiety mm-hmm. that started, it, well, I guess it was in the first trimester specifically about the twins. And then in the second trimester, I got more excited about that. I accepted it. I felt more confident that things were going to be okay, but I had really bad anxiety in general about mm-hmm. everything about, you know, I would, it'd be a Sunday and I really have always loved my job. And I would be like near tears. I can't do, I cannot work tomorrow. I can't do it. I just had really bad anxiety. Right. Um, and it was definitely, you know, it was hormonal and it was just so overwhelming, everything going on, but, um, it got better. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about dealing with that. Let's talk about that anxiety a little bit. You know, we obviously, you know, people who get pregnant after loss, you know, there's, you're always waiting for that other shoe to drop. Right. And, you know, you're so used to getting the bad news and the bad phone call. How did you deal with that? You know, you said you went to therapy. What else were you doing in terms of managing that time? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, you're so conditioned for bad news and you always think worst case scenario. So I would think like, why would this possibly work out well? And it took time. You know, I did have to, I went on an anxiety medication. I tried to get outside a lot more because we had been essentially locked up for two years Right. or, you know, um, we were so careful during COVID and, you know, cause of IVF and mm-hmm. I just, I had to, you know, we also were moving and there was just so much going on. And so I learned that like, I need to see people. I need to interact. I'm not a homebody. I'm a little more extroverted. Mm-hmm. So we saw some friends and, you know, my medication helped and I started exercising again and it really did help. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, don't get me wrong. Like I had anxiety the whole pregnancy, Sure, I do, but it did help a lot. Yeah. So what was happening, you know, with the babies, you were saying baby a who's Quinn, right. Yeah. Um, was smaller. Did that, was that the same case throughout the entire pregnancy? It was. Yes. Okay. He was always smaller anywhere from a few days up to, I think like a week and a half or 10 days at one point. And so she had IUGR, which is intrauterine growth restriction. Mm. So basically it's, it's really common with twins and she didn't have enough room to grow or she wasn't growing or her placenta wasn't working quite as well as it should. So she was always quite a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. So I thought that, you know, my days of IVF of being in the doctor's office three times a week were over. I was sorely mistaken because I was in my OB and my MFM all the time because she needed a lot of extra monitoring Mm -hmm. to make sure everything was okay. We had, how often were you going in at the end? I think twice a week. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So I had tons of ultrasounds and I, you know, I think about people who have, who were able to get pregnant easily and had uneventful pregnancies. And it's just, it's so unrelatable to me. Yeah. I mean, I just think like, 
the fact I can't imagine going in for one ultrasound at, you know, eight weeks, or whatever, going back at 24 weeks. And then right. again, I just, I cannot even imagine that. I know it is hard to imagine. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So she had, luckily they had two placentas. It's kind of this weird phenomenon that happens where I don't want to get like too much. It's too much into the, you know, technical, Mm -hmm. aspect. but basically IVF identical twins quote unquote should share one placenta Mm -hmm. because of when their cells are dividing. Like I'll just leave it at that, but they had two Mm -hmm. and two is a less risky pregnancy. And I asked my MFM, my high risk doctor, I said, how did this happen? Because there was so much back and forth for weeks and weeks on if they had one or two placentas. And she said, I don't know. We don't know how it happens, but it's lucky that it did. Mm -hmm. That gave me a lot of reassurance, even though she did have issues with her placenta. Basically the blood flow wasn't substantial enough which kind of affecting her growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was stressful the whole time. Right. Uh, Yeah. It was a lot. Let me ask you this because you have a, a big Instagram account and you're such a bright voice in this community. It's infertile and impatient. You know, you had been chronicling your journey up until, or you still are, but you know, I, I guess what I want to ask is how do you navigate that point when you've been in the trenches, you've been, you know, through so much loss, but then you get that good news. Did you have a hard time coming out and announcing that you were pregnant? Were you nervous that people were going to like, be mad or unfollow you or all that, which, you know, this is such a sensitive community and everyone's wonderful, but of course there's a lot of pain and a lot of people are going through a lot of shit. So how did you navigate that social media aspect of all of this? Yeah, there was a lot of, I guess, survivor's guilt Mm. because I felt like, good way to put it. Yeah. Yes. We had many miscarriages and I did lots of IVF and it was hard to get there, but I did one transfer and I ended up with twins and I felt like this IVF stereotype. And so it was really important to me that people didn't use my story as like a, Oh, well, my friend did IVF and she got twins. Right. You know, that's something that like we all hate to hear. And yeah. I, still, you know, I just, I posted on my personal page the other day for, you know, the first day of infertility awareness week. And I said, like, my story isn't common. This isn't typical of what happens. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of guilt that I have. And I still have, because there's so many people that I know, I just had a luckier hand than they did, you know, done two, three, four, five, six plus transfers. And why did I do one? And they and I got twins and they have done so many more. Mm-hmm. So it, it's hard. I didn't want anyone to feel, I know how it feels to be on the other end of that. And I didn't want to make anyone feel that way. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, I was someone who I, I would see acquaintances pregnant, like just like a little bit more distant acquaintances pregnant. And it would be really hard for me, but I did feel better about seeing IVF people or infertility people get pregnant because like I want a hundred percent success rate for them, but also for me, you know, I want, I have to be successful. So I do think it's important to, you know, hear all sides of IVF success stories, as well as ones that, you know, would not be considered a traditional success that ended up with the baby. Yeah. Well, I think you've navigated it really well. And with a lot of sensitivity and a lot of empathy and, you know, if people are listening and aren't following Taylor, definitely follow her at infertile and impatient, you know, there's, it's such a tricky, tricky thing, right? Cause it's like, we all become so close through this Instagram community. But like I said, there is a lot of pain there too. So it's always like, ah, oh, what should I share? What should I not share? I feel like I still, you know, wrestle with that. And my son from through IVF is six, you know, yeah. it's, I'm still not sure, like, you know, but I think you're, you're, you're doing a great job is the point of what I'm trying to say. (laughs) Thank you. I didn't share anything for really all of my pregnancy. I kind of went dark for a while and I did later on come and do kind of some like first trimester recaps or second trimester recaps. And a Mm -hmm. lot of it was for myself because I have written down every single part of my IVF experience down to the number of follicles measured on each ultrasound. Wow. That was, I was a little 
like over the top. I had like excels and like I would get the average follicle count. It was a little. Oh my God. I love it. You got to write a book someday. (laughs) Yeah. And um, I, but then I realized like, I don't know anything about my pregnancy and it's kind of a journal for me, you know, my Instagram, Mm -hmm. I don't journal. I'm not good at, you know, pregnancy books or baby books or whatever. So this is my journal. So it's kind of why I come back and decided to. Definitely. So I'm looking at your page right now and it's, you have pre P prom that acronym is that, so that tell me about that. I know I've talked to people with twins who've gone through that. Is that what you're talking about with the placenta and the the growth issues with Quinn? So that's IUDR. Yeah. Okay. So that's inner uterine growth restriction. Okay. Um, I was about 32 weeks. I well, actually probably 31 weeks. My blood pressure started creeping up a bit. So I just kept an eye on it. Uh, when I was 32 weeks and I think four days I went in for an NST just where they check the baby's movement, check their hearts. It's kind of like a, a different type of ultrasound. It's more of like listening to how they're moving and their heart rates and how their heart rates are accelerating and decelerating and things like that. And my blood pressure was high. And so they said, okay, you know what? We're going to send you down to labor and delivery. We just want to make sure you don't have preeclampsia and then you'll be good to go. And I said to her, so do I wait for the results? do I wait in labor delivery or can I go home and get the results? And she was like, oh, you should probably just hang out there until I get the results. Oh well, my God. Were you I freaking out went. that you were going to go in a <laughs> no, delivery? Like, oh. I thought, no, I wasn't. I was so nervous early on in my pregnancy. And by the time I got to the end, I just felt like I had no contractions. I had no physical feelings. I was going to be in labor anytime soon. Um, so that was, I was 32 weeks and four days. I was ended up being admitted overnight for my blood pressure. They said, you know, preeclampsia labs are negative, but we're just going to keep you here to monitor you, to monitor you. Um, well, when I was 32 weeks and six days, I went into labor mm. when I was still admitted. I, in the middle of the night, woke up, I called my nurse and my bed, I, my water had broken. Mm. And she, I just remember her so clearly. She was like, okay. Uh, I'm going to call the doctor and we're just going to see if it's your water broken. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, thank God, there's a chance. It's That's not what it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was. So that was around 2 a.m. And then by 1 p.m. the next day, the girls were born. Okay. So preterm, pre, the pre, pre-prom is preterm labor. Gotcha. Where my, yeah, my water broke early. All right. So now the girls are here, Quinn and Charlie. Mm -hmm. what were, how was your delivery? And I know obviously there's NICU time. So let's talk about that a little bit as well, please. Yeah. The delivery was relatively smooth. All things considered. I, C-section? Uh, no vaginal. No. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was really glad about that because I knew that the recovery was a lot, (laughs) a lot better. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, yeah, so they were taken to the NICU. Wait, who came out first? Quinn. Okay. Yeah. The little one. Yep, little <laughs> baby one. A. Yep. Baby A. She was teeny tiny. She wasn't crying when she came out. I was so freaked out. I was just like, is Quinn okay? Is Quinn okay? And I remember the nurse telling me, Quinn's going to be okay. You got to focus on Charlie now. And I was like, oh my God, there's another one. Oh my <laughs> I God. I love those names, Taylor. Yeah, thank love. You. Those were both, honestly, those were both on my girl name list. Really? If Sunny would have been a girl. Yep. Yeah. I love yeah. both those yeah. names so yeah. much. Yeah. So, you know, they were taken to the NICU. They were, Quinn was two pounds and 15 ounces. So Mm. she was, you know, teeny tiny and Charlie was four pounds Mm -hmm. and they did, you know, they were stable. I reread some of their discharge papers not too long ago. I'm glad I, (laughs) I'm glad they're okay now. And I read that because there was some stuff I didn't really realize had happened. Really? Um, Like what? Like Quinn, her, you know, when she was breathing, um, her breathing at the beginning wasn't, I can't remember exactly what they had to do, but they, it said resuscitation. They didn't have to actually re- revive her, Yeah, but you know, she, she struggled to breathe. Oh, wow. So yeah, it was hard. And then I had a lot of anxiety after they were born, uh, mm-hmm. really, really bad. I ended up developing postpartum pre- preeclampsia. Mm-hmm. So my blood pressure was extremely high. I was discharged and had to be readmitted. Mm-hmm. I was like borderline stroke. Oh I my remember God. When they readmitted me. They put like pillows alongside my bed. And I was like, wait a minute, what are you doing? It was like, in case I had a seizure, I couldn't go up to the NICU for like 48 hours. Oh, wow. Magnesium. It was really hard. And mm-hmm. I had 
extreme anxiety. Mm -hmm. I thought I was a heart failure. I thought I had a rare liver disease. I couldn't sleep. It was all. And I remember thinking, I can't tell anyone because they're going to say, you just had a baby. Your hormones are, you know, um, and I was like, this isn't my hormones. I know I'm in heart failure. Yeah. It was just, why did you think that? I mean, obviously as we've established, you're very in tune with your own body, but like, what were you feeling physically? Physically? Well, I know, I knew that with preeclampsia, it can cause, you know, your organs to like really severe, um, preeclampsia that turns into help syndrome can, you know, affect your organs. And so I don't know, I don't know why I thought I was in heart failure. Mm. I just did. Um, they had to do an ultrasound on my abdomen just because I was having epigra- epigastric pain mm-hmm. and they had to make sure there was nothing else going on. So they did an ultrasound and part of it was on my liver and they asked me, have you you know, travel outside of the country. And it was like mid ultrasound when she asked me this. And I'm assuming it was either COVID related or just like small talk, mm-hmm. but I freaked out. I thought, oh my God, I have this like rare liver disease that I, you can only get, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, it, it didn't make sense. Right. Or like Zika virus or something. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was, I don't know what I, what I thought, sure. but I was really, it was so bad. Yeah. Um, when I came home from the hospital, the second time without the girls, it was really hard. Mm-hmm. I was like, Sean would get up to go to the bathroom. I'd be like, please don't leave. Don't leave. Please don't leave me. Don't Aww. leave. I was, it was really bad. It was super intense for a couple of days and it did get a lot better. Mm-hmm. Luckily. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's obviously understandable. You've been through trauma, you know, yeah. like with not only the infertility stuff and the losses, but just this, you know, having these these preemies and, you know, that it's so fucking scary, you know, just to have a newborn in any regard, but just like, if there's a health issue and then your own health, and I'm sure you were spiraling and that's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. And I would go and see them. And I was just like, who are these babies? You know, I have to ask, like, not even I have to ask, they have to ask, tell me when I can hold them. They had all of these tubes, you know, down their throats and, Mm -hmm. IVs and pick lines. And I just was like, I didn't feel like they were my kids. It felt like these are just babies that we go visit. Yeah. That's interesting. So you didn't have that like bonding thing at first. No, I don't think so. Yeah. It was hard because I, I mean, I couldn't even pick them up at Mm -hmm. first, but like several days went by before I could even hold them. And I was scared to touch them, you know, like they were so little. And I remember they asked me when I change their diaper. And I said, yes, because I felt like I had to, but I was like, holy shit, I can't change this diaper. What yeah. if I break her, you know? Totally. Totally. Oh my God. I'm so glad you're saying all of this Taylor, because I don't think people talk about this enough and it's so important that we share yeah. this stuff, you know? So thank yeah. you. Yeah. It, it's hard kind of thinking about, you see these like, beautiful pictures on Instagram, right. like a baby is just born and they bring it to the mom and the mom, it, like, it was not like that. I mean, right. I didn't even, they showed me Quinn for two seconds. I had to like rush her away. And Charlie, I mean, I saw her briefly, but not, I didn't get to hold her. It was just like, here she is and took her away to, you know, make sure yeah. she could leave. And yeah, it was, it's it not was, like the Pampers commercial. This is like, it's life <laughs> or death. It's like, this yeah, is, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh man. So tell me about the NICU. How long were they there and who they didn't come home at the same time, right? No, they okay. were there. Charlie was there for a month and Quinn was there for six weeks. Okay. Shout out to all the NICU parents and NICU doctors and nurses and helpers. And oh my God. And I felt so safe with them being there and the NICU nurses. Oh my God. I think about them every day. I, yeah you know, we miss them. They were amazing. And they taught us how to take care of them. You know, I, there's so many things that we learned there and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, Oh, it was so worth it. It wasn't right. But they taught us so much and they were so amazing. And, you know, when we brought them home, I was like, shit, what do we, I got to ask Mary, like, you know, <laughs> right. what do you want me to do with her? <laughs> like, totally. <laughs> right. So Charlie came home first and how long was Quinn there? Quinn was there 10, 10 more days. Okay. Okay. So what did it feel like? And what does it feel like now? You know, you guys are, how old are the girls now? They are going to be seven months. Oh my God. Friday. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. they're growing and they're getting chubby and they're so <laughs> adorable, which is great. And you told me yeah. before we started recording, they just ate eggs 
for the first time. So they are thriving and you guys, you and John are doing such a great job. Tell me about life today. And then before we wrap, I'd love to hear what you, if you have a message for anybody listening that might be like still in the trenches. Yeah. Today it's a lot better. Things have the last, I would say, especially two or three months, you know, the girls are getting bigger. Um, my anxiety is better. I, they're more fun. You know, it's like we can interact with them. It's, it's, it's been great. Um, months one through or zero through, I guess, four were, were difficult with them, you know, mm-hmm. not just like you, but when we came home, we had an incident with Quinn mm-hmm. where he stopped breathing. And he ended up back in the PICU and the, you know, children's hospital for a week. And so there was, I basically 20 times a day for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks thought she wasn't breathing. Yeah. That's and scary. It was, it was terrifying. Yeah. And now they're to a place where, you know, they're healthy. I don't have to sleep with a stethoscope next to their bed anymore, which Aww, I would- honey. Because I can go in their room and check on them and I can hear them breathing, Yeah, you know? Right. Um, so it's been fun. It's really hard. I think everyone kind of makes it seem like, oh, once they hit 12 weeks, they're sleeping all night and they're doing... No, that's not mm-hmm. the case. They've gotten in some ways a little bit harder as they've gotten older, but it's better than I ever expected. And they are amazing. Mm-hmm. And I love yeah. that you just have always kept it so real. You know, there was a post you did the other day about... I think that I'm probably going to butcher it, but they had slept through the night basically. But then you were like, don't get me wrong. This is an anomaly. Like this is not, I don't want you to think this is easy. I don't want anyone to feel badly if their babies aren't doing this, you know? So I think I love that about you and, you know, just your, the the stuff that you're putting out there because you're, it's real life and it's messy. And of course there's wonderful moments, but there's really fucking hard moments too. And you've shared all of that. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many things that I think, you know, people can kind of feel bad about. And as soon as I posted that, I was like, oh my God, I I hope that, you know, I'm not making anyone feel bad if their baby isn't sleeping through the night because it was, we got lucky one night with one right. baby, you know? Yeah. And you said that. And that's what I mean. Yeah. I was like, I love yeah. that you said that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause those, all those accounts out there for anyone listening that are like, my baby's perfect. And it's like, oh, fuck off. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I can't relate to that. Or like, you know, I hate to say like, oh, you just wait. But like, honestly, though, you know, mine were easier in some ways. And I thought, oh, they're going to be sleeping all night in a couple, you know, and they would like start waking up more and more the older they got. So it's like, you know, you never know what's really going on. Exactly. So this is, you know, maybe a sensitive topic that you don't need to talk about if you don't want to, but you know, you've got embryos left. Have you guys discussed that? Or is it just kind of like, let's get through the now and make sure these girls are healthy or like, where do you, you know, I know that it's another topic. I don't think people talk a lot about. So I'm just curious what you guys are thinking, if you're willing to share that. It is a a hard decision. Uh, We have two embryos left and pretty much right when the girls were born, we started getting our, you know, every three month bill for embryo storage. So every three months when we get that bill, it's like, shit, it kind of puts some, some pressure on you that you need to make a decision Mm -hmm. on what you want to do next. Mm -hmm. It's another example of like, where people who just can have kids on their own, like don't have to make these decisions right away. Yeah. So I think given everything that happened, you know, the preterm labor and the long NICU stay and the preeclampsia and I had gestational diabetes and, you know, complications with the placenta and so many different things. I I don't know if we would do another transfer, honestly, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I go back and forth. Um, I know everyone says like, once you get past the baby phase and you start to get baby fever again, I mean, maybe we're certainly not going to make any decisions with what we do with any remaining embryos for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, if I had to pick, I would say we're probably done with two, but I don't know. Yeah. It's hard. That's the beauty of life. You don't know, you don't know how you're going to feel in six months or a year or more than that, you know? So thank you for, thanks for talking about that. Um, all right, before we wrap Taylor, I know you got to go tell me about, you know, anything that you have to say to someone who might be listening. That's just like in the, in the thick of it right now. I think there's two things. The first thing for me that was always so helpful was finding balance. Like I was saying with the caffeine, you know, 
if you're, if you are struggling with infertility, it's not because you drink coffee. And that's just like one example, but you had to find balance because it could be a year, two, three, four, five long year process. And you could wake up in five or six years with no children. And you realize that you sacrificed everything. And so it's like, you know, not making fertility the only thing in your life, which is mm-hmm. way easier said than done. But there were times where we had to force ourselves. Okay. We cannot talk about IVF this weekend. Like when we went away for my 30th birthday, I said, mm-hmm. we can't, I'm going to bring it up. Don't respond. <laughs> Just ignore me. We can't talk about it. And so really trying to find, you know, the balance of like, you know, eating, Diet, eating a diet that you think is, is helpful for, for fertility, but also not, you know, giving up pizza for five years. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like right. how do you find some type of balance. So that way you can still live your life. Yeah. And the second thing is there's so many things I wish I could go back and say, like, if I knew then what I knew now, mm-hmm. but, or what I know now, but you have to be your own advocate. And that's something that I've learned from fertility and from the NICU and from the PICU. And, you know, you have to push, if you want more tests, you have to ask, no one's going to fight harder for you than you. And so you have to be that person for yourself because, you know, unfortunately no one else will. And these fertility doctors are amazing and they change lives and they can, you know, work miracles, but you're the one it's your family and it's, you know, your life. And so you really have to fight for yourself the way you would fight for, you know, someone that you care about. All right, friends, thank you so much for listening and definitely check out Fertility Rally this week. This is the lowest annual rate we're going to offer all year. It's 129 for the entire year, which is just insanity. So We would love to support you. We have so many support groups. We're doing more IRL events this year as well. And we have this great online community. We have private Facebook groups and just all this great stuff. So we've built this family. We're super proud of it. And we would love to have you join us no matter who you are, what you're going through, where you live. This is worldwide. So check us out on Instagram at Fertility Rally and at our website, fertilityrally.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you guys soon.